afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Campus Consortium's Ed Talks webinar series on identity and access management, security benefits, and risks of popular platforms. If you have any questions now or during today's presentation, please type them into the chat box or questions pane in the Zoom control panel. Without further ado, I would like to pass the platform to Dr. Carl Horvath, President at Campus Consortium. Thank you, David. Much appreciated. And welcome, everyone. Thank you for participating in our webinar today. My name is Carl. I'm the president of Campus Consortium, a national technology association dedicated to education. Today, we'll be talking about identity and access management and security two topics that are very important for many institutions. And we have a great panel lined up who are experts in these areas and can speak from different perspectives to inform your IT security stance and how you can best manage resources in your institution and provide optimal services for your students, faculty, and staff. Today, we have four vendors that are very popular in this space and have a long history with education customers. We have uh, Cirrus Identity, Duo Security, Quick Launch, and Nine Star. And I will introduce each as we move through the presentation and tell you a little bit about them. And I thank each one of our panelists today for joining, uh, Deidre, Wolfgang, Vince, and Benet. Before we get started, I would like to talk to you a little bit about Campus Consortium. Campus Consortium has been around since 2003 and has been dedicated to supporting education institutions in terms of accessing technology and the affordability of technology and thought leadership. And that's what we're doing today as we will be talking about identity and access management and going beyond just the technical aspect of uh, identity and access management, but also how it fits into the culture and the workflow of your institution. Campus Consortium offers a number of services, so please join uh, or visit our website to find out more. And I just wanted to tell you a little bit about uh, two security events and working groups that we have. Cybersecurity Working Group, it's a virtual working group. It provides access to many other education institutions and provides opportunities for collaboration, knowledge sharing, project collaboration on all aspects of security, including identity and access management, security operations center, uh, multi-factor authentication, incident response, and others. So if you would like to join that group, please do, and you'll be able to work with other institutions such as yourself to find out more and collaborate. The other event we have is the annual Cybersecurity Summit, and that summit includes guest speakers who are experts in cybersecurity, educational institutions who share their knowledge. We have a number of presentations. We have a number of vendors that also participate. So it's a great opportunity to learn more about identity and access management and security aspects of it. And special thanks to our four vendors who are participating today, Cirrus Identity, Duo, Quick Launch, and also um, Nightstar. Thank you for being here. So I'd like to start out with a poll question, we have a few poll questions as those of you who have attended our webinars before, it's good to have audience interaction and get feedback from you as we present our topic for the day because it really directs and informs the flow of conversation. So please participate, we'll give you about 30 seconds to answer each poll question and we'll display the results on the screen. Does your institution use an identity and access management platform? Not really, somewhat, or yes, we do. That's basically those three answers. If you could just take 30 seconds and answer that question, 
it will be interesting to see where everybody's positioned at this time. Today's topic of discussions are, of course, the identity and access management cloud platforms. We'll talk about the security benefits and cautions for educational institutions. And we will also talk about platform resources and vendors that the, the vendors themselves who provide the platforms also have to depend on third party platforms to provide their services to education institutions and how they do that. So uh, any questions regarding any of this, uh, please, uh, as David mentioned, submit them to the question and answer or the chat. So identity and access management is more than just technology. It's a framework of policies, workflows, and services to help your operations flow more smoothly and to provide security and protection for data and people. There are aspects to identity and access management, such as user management and uh, centralizing your resources, authentication and organization. There's information in this PowerPoint deck that we will send to all of you about uh, current trends in identity and access management, Gartner. This is a Gartner resource. Uh, we also have workflows about frameworks of identity and access management, security and governance, which is more policy and big picture, but it's essential when you're gonna deploy a platform that really impacts every part of your institution and every participating user in the community. Uh, some of the issues that many institutions that I talk to across the country every week is, their legacy infrastructure that sometimes is decades old, but they're still using it because of cost and expertise issues. There's also the student life cycle. Students expect the same thing they get from Amazon.com or their gaming website or mobile apps they use every day. How can institutions provide similar experiences for their current students? And of course, anomalies in terms of access to systems such as vendors, even alumni who have perhaps graduated from the institution but still need access to resources. And so there's a number of key components and requirements for identity and access management systems in this PowerPoint deck we'll send to you. You can review those. Any questions, please ask us at campus. We're happy to help you understand this information or make contact with the appropriate resources for your particular needs. And then we also have a section here about finding the right platform for your institution. Every institution is the same, but every institution is different. Yes, everyone is servicing students and working with faculty and staff but every institution has a unique mission and a different approach to how they provide services to their student and their visitors and their guests. So those are all important areas that uh, we will talk about today. Second poll question, choose the technologies and services you use to manage access for students, faculty, and staff. Do you currently use single sign-on? Or do you have a system to manage users? Uh, do you have uh, multi-factor authentication? Platforms provide all these things, but sometimes institutions have deployed one or the other, or they may have designed it in-house and implemented a single sign-on solution, but they don't have other aspects of creating accounts or uh, authorizing uh, access to specific resources. So please take 30 seconds to answer that question. We'd, we'd appreciate that. And uh, we will address that information as we get the information in. But I'd like to start today by introducing our first presenter, Deidre Chamberlain. Deidre is the founder and CEO of Cirrus Identity, and her goal is to take the frustration out of secure access to online services so people can easily access tools they need and collaborate more effectively. And really uh, the user centric approach is most important because that will get the 
institution to be able to complete objectives, reach their goals, and grow uh, more quickly, more effectively, and more securely. So, Deidre, thank you for joining us today. Looking forward to what your discussion will be about this topic. And uh, please uh, take it away. I'm going to hand it over to you. Okay, my pleasure. You can go ahead and uh, skip to the next slide, Carl. Thank you. So I've been in the identity management and higher education space for over two decades. I led the identity management team at UC Berkeley um, for almost 10 years. And it's been almost 10 years now that I've been running Serious Identity. And I've stayed in this space for so long because um, I really care about higher education. I really um, believe in the educational mission. I love how collaborative higher education is. And the reality is that a lot of commercial identity solutions don't really fit exactly well in the higher ed space. And so building tools that will help fill some of those gaps is part of why I started Serious Identity in the first place. Um, and I'm really, I love to talk about how things are different in higher ed. Um, I only have 10 minutes today or nine minutes. So I'm gonna focus on two of those main differences today. One is multilateral federation. And one is the fact that you have lots of users that need access to your systems who aren't in your core system. They're not students, faculty, and staff. So if you uh, go to the next slide, the first, I'm gonna start by talking about how, you know, when I first got into this field in cybersecurity and identity management, the prevailing wisdom was that you had to have a, a perimeter around your key assets in the commercial world. You're gonna protect your enterprise, build up um, you know, your VPNs, your intrusion protection systems, your um, firewalls, and, and tr relatively trust people who are inside your walled garden and don't trust people who are outside of it. Nowadays, the prevailing wisdom is that you can't really trust your perimeter. You have to adopt a zero trust philosophy and um, you know, uh, authenticate and authorize each individual access to a resource. So next slide. The thing that I think is really fascinating is that the higher education world has been playing this zero trust game for decades. Um, within the higher education space, openness and public access are part of our core mission and mandate. And so we've been dealing with providing accessible services on the open internet for, for a long, long time. Universities collaborate across institutions. Um, you have shared resources that multiple people need to access like a wiki, or um, you know, access to a, a research collaboration platform. And you have hundreds of in, uh, researchers across hundreds of institutions who need to access these shared resources. So it was the higher ed community that built tools that allowed us within higher ed to trust people who are outside our walled gardens decades ago. Mm -hmm. So next slide. Um, a quick example of this, take the NIH, which is a really uh, popular um, and widely utilized in higher ed um, platform for research and health. They need to give secure access to researchers at hundreds of institutions. So if you go to the next slide, in a typical bilateral federation, which is really common in commercial identity management, the NIH would take its SAML um, service provider metadata, integrate that with an identity provider for an institution, and there would be a bilateral trust between the service provider and the identity provider. That's what commercial world considers federation. So imagine the NIH has to do that with another campus and then another campus on the next slide and another campus. You can see quickly that this approach, the bilateral federation approach does not scale for collaboration across institutions. So imagine on the next slide that you have a trust framework where you can register all of these campuses, SAML identity providers, and this trust framework will establish baseline expectations for how identities are created in these identity providers, who owns and manages those identity providers. And so then on the next slide, the NIH can join this trust framework, register their service provider there, and very quickly and simultaneously integrate trust relationships across hundreds of institutions across the world in one fell swoop. And that is the, the promise and the value of the In Common Identity Federation in the US, which is connected to the EduGain Federation around the world. So next slide. Uh, this is really powerful. There are many, many applications out there. The NIH is one example. These are some of the other ones that we encounter quite a bit when we're out there doing our work um, who leverage multilateral federation to access uh, researchers and, and scholars across um, their networks. Next slide. The biggest challenge is that commercial identity management solutions don't support multilateral federation. So if you're running Azure AD as your um, identity provider, you can't register in the in common federation metadata. 
So a lot of campuses will either download something like Shibboleth, which is a really popular open source product, part of the Uncommon Trusted Access platform. Some campuses use Simple Sample PHP, another open source project, which is very popular in Europe. And Serious Identity uh, offers a bridge solution, which will allow you to connect Azure AD, Okta, Duo, SSO, your commercial platform to the Uncommon Federation. So to Carl's point earlier, in terms of picking identity platform, Sometimes there isn't one platform that's going to serve all of your needs, and there are a variety of modules that you can choose from vendors that are best in class for what they do. Uh, okay, so that's multilateral federation. The other area where I want to talk about what's different in higher education is um, in commercial identity management, the life cycle of a user is typically you get hired, you get enrolled, you're in the walled garden, and then you leave. Uh, whereas in higher education, next slide, the life cycle really is a person's whole lifespan because you have people who come in as high school students, they apply to college, uh, then they have their time in college, they graduate. But once they graduate their alumni, you want to maintain a connection with them for the rest of their life as mentors, as donors, as um, coming to their uh, homecoming events. So next slide. Uh, the other thing is in higher education, as I mentioned earlier, you have a lot of users who are not those students, faculty, and staff, those people in the red in this photo at your commencement ceremony. You have alumni, you have applicants, you have parents, you have research collaborators, continuing education. The volume of users who are outside your core system is actually greater than those who are in your core identity set. So how do you streamline access for all these people? Next slide. Uh, a lot of folks like parents and alumni, they don't log in that frequently. And so when they come back, they've forgotten their password. They have a very frustrating experience. Next slide. If you have an alumni who's trying to make a donation and they're frustrated logging in, customer drop off is a big problem for you revenue wise. Uh, so you want to avoid this if possible. Next slide. So what we do at Sirius is we attempt to uh, provide tools that allow campuses to streamline access using things like social login, and our hosted guest account system when they're applicants. You only create an identity in their enterprise world when they're a student, and then you can move them back to social external login when they graduate. So it's a seamless process. Next slide. Actually, just go to the next one. I'm gonna just show you a few examples of implementations. This, for example, at the University of Oregon for applicants, you often want to give them access to things like financial aid information before they actually enroll. And so you can, provide social login access, which we do so you don't have to create a duck ID, their, their enterprise identity until they actually enroll. Uh, next slide. Another common use case at the other end of the life cycle is for transcript access. Here's an implementation at UCSD where they're allowing social login, campus login, or our hosted guest account system to get access to transcripts. And then the last slide, this is uh, a continuing education example at the University of Florida where they use um, Modern Campus and Canvas for their, uh, ex their continuing ed program, and they allow social login as well as campus login. So that kind of just gives you two examples of how a uh, higher ed identity is different from commercial identity. And we love talking to people on campuses, learning more about what you're doing and answering questions you might have. We've lived your pain, so you have our contact information. Thank you, Deidre. That's, uh... Very interesting, and I can see from many different perspectives in educations where you've been able to identify uh, the challenges and address them in terms of identity and access management. So uh, great presentation. I would like to just take a moment to pause and call out a few of our attendees today. Uh, didn't get a chance to do this at the beginning, but before we move on to our next presentation uh, with uh, Cisco Duo, uh, we have, uh, you know, a, a, a regular attendee looks like Franklin and Marshall College is attending today. Thank you for being here. Carnegie Mellon University as well. Uh, Iowa State University. Uh, we have San Francisco State University. I, I love the representation from across the entire country. We always get so many uh, different institutions from East to Midwest to West. And uh, James Madison, Miami University, Boston Architectural College, Louisiana State University, James Madison University, Stony Brook, Seton Hill University, Rockhurst, uh, Appalachian State University, Amherst College, and uh, so many more. So I really want to thank uh, everyone for attending today, and we will be sure to be in touch with you with all these 
information resources and the insight from our guest panelists today. I'm going to ask one more quick poll question. And again, if we don't get to presenting these in this presentation and giving you the feedback, we will send it out to you when we send you the uh, recording of this webinar. So you will know what everyone answered. What IT security questions do you ask your identity and access management vendor? We don't ask questions. We focus on functionality or we regard our platforms as a form of security, or we ask our vendors for a security report annually. If you could just take the next 30 seconds, audience, to please answer these questions. We'd appreciate the input and feedback, and we will, again, as I said, share that with everyone. Our next presenter is Wolfgang Gorich. He's a strategist and futurist. Wolfgang is a Cisco Duo Advisory Chief Information Security Officer for Duo Security. He led IT and IT security in the healthcare and financial and services verticals and advisory and assessment practices in several cybersecurity consulting firms. So uh, Wolfgang, you have a lot of expertise around this area and working with Cisco who has so many other solutions that many of our education sector members and attendees and view and uh, attendees today uh, are have uh, on their campuses uh, could you speak to identity and access management and security absolutely thanks so much carl it's great to be here you know when i came out of being a ciso in financial services i went into consulting and one of the the early customers that we were working with was just the space, right? EDU. And I remember saying, all right, well, what does your DMZ look like? What does your network look like? And they're like, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> In your world, maybe a DMZ was two computers, three servers, right? You need to understand in higher ed, our entire network is effectively the DMZ. Our core is really the small part. It's like, oh, all right, fair enough. And then I was leading an IAM practice. My second eye-opening experience was I'm leading this practice and I was talking about role-based access. So we're going to have people come on. We're going to give them roles. When they change uh, jobs, we're going to remove those roles. And they're like, all right, yeah, that sounds good. But what happens when I've got a student who's part-time faculty and, oh, by the way, you know, is also working on uh, the IT side part-time to earn some money? What roles do they go and bend? And how do I handle when these roles change? And it really quite quickly dawned on me the incredible complexity of this space. So I'm so glad to be talking here today. I loved everything Deidre was saying. Uh, if you'd take me to the next slide, I'm, I don't have a lot of slides today, but just to sort of paint the, the picture. When we think about uh, I am, I'm going to be speaking to predominantly the authentication side and then a little bit to the authorization side. When we think about what Deidre was saying, right, we've got a central identity, hopefully, we've got the identity federator, which is such an important challenge to solve. That zero trust side comes into question. How am I extending trust to those people? Um, how am I removing trust if something has gone awry? And how am I doing that consistently by policy across a variety of different use cases, across a variety of different applications, uh, across a variety of different systems and identities and everything else. So this is really where dual security comes in. What dual security is predominantly known for is, is multi-factor. So I'm authenticating in and I'm going to provide a, a code. I'm going to click a button. I'm going to use my security badge or security key. There's this really interesting generational sea change that's happening today with multi-factor. Uh, in the past, right, us adults were uh, having our controls and very resistant to it in many cases. Don't make me carry around a badge. Please don't make me type in six character numbers. Why do I have to reach for my phone? I put my phone across the room. So I would pay attention to this uh, work I need to do and not get it on Twitter, right? It's, it's been the way it is. 
Now our kids are being incentivized. There's uh, Epic Games has done a great job of this. Riot Games has done a great job of this. With Epic Games a couple years ago, they said, if you install and apply multi-factor, we're going to give you a boogie down emote and your character can dance. And suddenly kids are like, hey, uh, mom, dad, can you show me how to do multi-factor? Because I want my characters to dance. And then Riot Games has recently said you have additional power-ups and access to additional levels if you've got multi-factor. So it's intriguing because a lot of the resistance that we plan for in security has now become generational. And this, of course, is not the first time we've seen something like this happen. If you think back to seatbelts, I'm sure everyone who's listening to this is like, oh, of course, I get a car, I put on my seatbelt. But that wasn't always the case, right? When we were we kids, um, we had to be convinced to wear seatbelts. And then when, when the kids are wearing seatbelts and they're asking their parents, hey, mom, dad, how come you're up front and you're not buckled in? So the parents are feeling pressure to wear seatbelts. And 20 years later, everyone is, is seatbelted and safe. I expect the same thing to happen with multi-factor as kids want to have these power-ups, want to have this additional access, which makes uh, it uh, intriguing because from a campus perspective, we're now raising a generation that's much more amenable and understandable to these security controls. Now, if we're just doing multi-factor, that would be one thing. Um, at least that's better. It prevents like account takeovers and compromises and password theft. Uh, it would be even better if we got rid of the password altogether. So when we think about the futurist side of my role, one of the things that I'm working on, and if you have Duo, I'd encourage you to uh, reach out and, and take a look at this. One of the things that I've been advocating for a long time is if we've got strong factors plus a password to authenticate, let's get rid of the password altogether. <laughs> this, is, this is the weakest part. It's the part that's always written down, right? Or here's your, your uh, student badge. And by the way, your password is your student ID. Uh, those types of scenarios. So the future side of multi-factor is going to be passwordless and removing the password altogether. Lots of work already being done on this. Duo already has a, a offering and limited availability for just this thing. But if we're just doing that, okay, that's fine. That's good. But we don't want to have people have to click all the time. We don't want to have people to enter their factor in all the time. We need to provide a better user experience. So one of the things that Duo will recognize very early on is if we're not able to do password less yet, maybe we can do less passwords. Maybe we can do less authentication. And the way we do that is through a few different ways. On the multi-factor cell itself, let's remember the device. Generally, a 12-hour or a 18-hour period is not going to create a lot of concern for most of the students and the faculty and the people we're thinking about. Certainly, if it's an IT professional, certainly if it's someone who has access to core resources, we're going to want to prompt them all the time. But the ability to create a policy um, that reduces friction is incredibly important. Uh, the other side of that is single sign-on. So how can we deliver our applications once we've got central identity through single sign-on where I'm going to assert myself once the single sign-on pane, go through that multi-factor, maybe authenticate with passwordless. From there, all my apps are going to go open up. So SSO has really become a critical component and one of the most widely used uh, features from Duo uh, in addition to the MFA side. So strong authentication, single sign-on, good. Now, back to what Deidre was talking about. Where we're moving predominantly as an industry is towards zero trust. How do I trust someone? And there's a lot of different papers on zero trust. There's a standard on zero trust, which myself and others at Cisco contributed to. Uh, CISA has a zero trust maturity model. If you want to deep dive, into this, I'd encourage you to reach out and we've got uh, workshops that we provide to, to get deep on us. But really all you need to know is from a zero trust perspective, it's a strongly authenticated user. I spent most of my time talking about that already. It's a strongly authenticated device. I'm gonna check that device to make sure it's up to date and I know what it is. Really crucial for helping our students and faculty maintain their equipment. Uh, especially when it's a BYOD or their own personal equipment. So we're going to make sure it's patched and up to date. I'm going to make sure that there's no signs that I shouldn't trust it, like signs of infection, signs of malware, signs of it being stolen, signs of impossible travel. I'm going to check all these things at the time of requesting an application. And if they all check out, 
I'm going to extend trust. They can click on SSO. They can launch their apps. If anything is amiss, I'm going to revoke that trust. And I may say, hey, before you launch uh, Canvas, please update your iPhone. Before you uh, get into uh, this particular lab environment, please update your, your Windows or your MacBook. That combination, I believe, is incredibly important to move from that walled garden approach to the zero trust approach. And what we're finding is it's one of the easiest ways to implement the zero trust principles uh, and one of the fastest ways to provide security across a variety of different devices, a variety of different accounts, and a variety of different environments. So that's it. Strong authentication, single sign-on, trusted access. That's what dual security is providing to our uh, our friends in education. I'll turn it back to you, Carl. Uh, Wolfgang, thank you so much. How succinct was that? That was uh, great. Uh, thank you for those inputs and also the perspectives, which I think helps our attendees understand you know, how these solutions, even the big picture concept of identity and access management can fit into their institution. But it, it's, it's like a two for one. You know, not only do you get the, the workflow, the efficiency, the productivity, but you also get the security. So it's uh, really something I think uh, everybody should be looking at. And I think the other part of this is that I found in the institutions I've worked in over the years is that it's actually doable and that you can do it no matter how small or how many limited resources you have. So uh, good, good input from our first two presenters. I just want to quickly uh, provide you feedback on the poll questions that you've been answering because we're going to another poll question in just a moment. Poll one, uh, which was, does your institution use an identity and access management system? Uh, about 29%, 30% of our attendees say no, not currently. And then uh, about 38% uh, said, well, somewhat. And that probably means they may have hybrid solutions. And then 33% uh, the said, yes, they do use a platform. So. Uh, it's really been, our audience is divided up into thirds. So that's uh, great feedback. Thank you uh, for, for that information. The second poll question, choose the technologies and services used to manage access for students, faculty, and staff. Select all that apply. Uh, the top two, uh, well, the very number one item that they use, the technologies, are multi-factor authentication. Number two is single sign-on. They're very close in terms of responses. And the third one, user management, I, this would be in terms of understanding what user management is, centralized repository of users, provisioning and deprovisioning. Uh, only 38% of users uh, or attendees uh, mentioned that they uh, use this in their institution. So a lot of people have already implemented single sign-on or MFA solutions, but uh, there is nothing like an integrated centralized system to help manage uh, your environment. And the third poll question so far, uh, before we get to the fourth one is, what IT security questions do you ask your vendor? And uh, by far, the biggest question is, uh, we regard our identity and access management platform as a form of security. And that's what this webinar is about today, identity and access management and security. So 68% of our uh, respondents uh, indicated that uh, they uh, likened uh, access or identity and access to security. Uh, to a lesser extent, we had 16% uh, uh, say that we don't ask security questions and 16% uh, say that we ask uh, for a security report annually. So thank you so much audience for and attendees for participating in that. It helps other institutions understand where they are in terms of identity and access management. And it also uh, provides uh, input from uh, you know, uh, the, their IT security stance as well. Uh, before we move on to the next question, we have a question from Cody Eckert. Uh, this may or not may be appropriate question for this webinar, but 
Uh, Cody is curious about how institutions handle identity and access management in regard to user provisioning and deprovisioning. And that's just what we talked about. It looks like most people are using SSO or MFA, but not as many institutions are dealing with their provisioning and deprovisioning. And that's so important. I can I can tell you from experience in two education institutions where we didn't have that. We had uh, old VB scripts or is something from the uh, late 90s or early 2000s that were used to generate accounts. And this was real, really problematic in terms of onboarding new students and also new employees. And so using a platform really made the system much more efficient because students and uh, new employees expected could expect when they would get their access to systems to do their job or to learn. Uh, in terms of people who left, uh, you know, there's also accounts, and I'm, I've been guilty of this in the past, of saying, uh, somebody said, so-and-so left three months ago, but they still have access to the XYZ resource. Not a good thing, right? That's not good for your security stance. So you also want to not just provision users, but deprovision them as well. So thank you for that question. Uh, and I'm sure our panel can comment on that, uh, Cody. Also, uh, looks like uh, we have a question about uh, uh, from Wolfgang to the audience who answered a question. So thanks so much. All right, I'm gonna move on to the next question. And the next question is, identify identity and access management security issues and challenges at your institution, select all that apply. How will identity and access management impact user experience for students, faculty, and staff? That's always a concern, going from an old system to a new system. It will impact not just the end users, but also the departments like human resources who onboard new employees, like admissions and enrollment, who onboard new students every year. Uh, that is a important factor when considering a new platform. How complex will a platform be to deploy since many institutions, and particularly since the pandemic, have lost funding, a budget, and staffing to deal with working with platforms or uh, you know, uh, providing customer service. We really want to make sure that institutions can redirect their resources, their staffing to help students, staff and faculty. And then uh, we have campus remote users, guest vendors who need access. That's always an anomaly uh, that uh, sometimes takes customized exception, which is not always good. Can a platform deal with those anomalies? And the overall implementation and maintenance costs. So affordability of a platform is a concern for many institutions. Lastly, training the community, which also kind of relates to the uh, lack of expertise on a campus or lack of staffing to be able to help manage or implement a platform. That's a concern too for many institutions that I've talked to in the past year. So uh, please answer each of these items, uh, attendees that apply to your institution. We'd love to hear from you. I'm going to move us on to the next presenter, which is Vince Pisapati. And Vince is a uh, chief operating officer for Quick Launch, an identity and integration platform. Vince has 21 years of experience in identity and access management, and he's been involved in many technical and management roles. And he's been exposed to numerous diverse product systems and environments, particularly in the education environment. So I know that Vince, you support a lot of education institutions uh, from your uh, organization, your company, and uh, I'm going to hand it over to you. Thank you, Paul. Good afternoon. My name is Vince. I am the Chief Operating Officer here at Quick Launch. And uh, let's move to the next slide. Let's start off. We have the time. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to cover as much as I can in these 10 minutes here. Yeah. So it, the realities in education, like uh, Deidre spoke about, are totally different from what uh, commercial 
organizations have. So large number of users, changing user base, this means uh, uh, educational institutions have a far larger number of users and the user base keeps changing. There are new users coming in and going out on a regular basis. Yeah, then again, they might not be going out. Diverse user profiles, there, these ch roles change for each of these uh, users. Uh, like one of the uh, participants asked, a student will become alumni, could become faculty. So these roles keep changing and could also be taking multiple roles at the same time. And uh, diverse user profiles means that the same solution will have to cater to users who are from teenagers to uh, 50, 60 plus of okay. age. So the user experience for these users has to be something that caters to these people. So, and there are multiple devices, with the, uh, so users want to access them, access the systems from their devices. There is a uh, bring your own device uh, logic also that goes in. So, and there are diverse access points, which means uh, users are traveling. They could access from access the systems from different parts of the country or even the world for that matter. So these give rise to a number of different challenges in the uh, education sector. So these are manual identity tasks. These are every time there is a new user, there are manual creation of identities that is creating these users in different various systems, manual ad hoc access requests. There are people want access to, as and when people want access to a particular system, they ask for access to that and that those requests have to be addressed, multiple affiliations. There again, this is what I was talking about where we have users in different roles and transient users, users keep coming and moving out temporary users, contingent faculty. There are multiple identity stores sometimes for different roles. And also there are a number of legacy systems. These are systems which are, which have been in the system for a large number of, for a long time. And uh, it's going to take a huge effort to replace this. So these are just there and custom siloed solutions have been built to serve the purpose of addressing different requirements at different stages. And all these put together also a question on how we can handle the compliance requirements. There are a number of compliance requirements that have to be uh, addressed. So all these are some of the challenges that we face and uh, threats, of course, due to the challenges, there are always threats. There could be uh, denial of service, insider threats, yeah, ransomware, man in the middle, phishing. Yeah, I don't want to get into details of what each of these are. I'm sure that a number of these, uh, a few of these different people might have encountered at different stages. So moving forward to the next slide. So what happens is the key thing here in education, the, what is the benefit of having an IM solution? The benefit of having an IM solution is that we can give only the right access for the right people to the right resources at the right time. If we are able to take care of this, this means we have secured our system and that is possible through a different set of features and functionalities that an IAM solution can provide. Quick launch as such was built grounds up with uh, from the ed education uh, uh, requirements in mind because we started as when we started we were thrown a challenge and we began with discussions with various universities and colleges on how on the different issues that they were facing and what we can do to sort these issues out and from there began the idea and the initiation of quick launch so even today we are proud that each and every feature we do not make features and say that hey we have built this do you want to use it what we do is we build each and every feature of ours based on consultation and work and from the working groups the requirements that come from each of our clients and the various other overall working groups that we do through consultations so from these people we get all our ideas and that is where we build our solutions so they are quite tailor-made to the requirements of the education sector. 
So looking at the right people, let me cover a, a few of these things. Uh, directory integration. So right people, the idea is to have all the identities mapped in a particular directory, a single place which can act as the source of truth that this is the final list of identities that have to be maintained. So uh, we there are most cloud-based uh, cloud solutions. They integrate with the directory. What Miklons does is it leverages the existing directory. We do not make a copy of the directory within ourselves. Yeah, that has resulted in some security breaches for some identity companies. Yeah, some cloud-based identity companies. So we are trying to avoid it as far as we can. Maybe someday we might also have to do it, but yeah, for now we are not doing it. We are leveraging the directory of the you know, institution itself. Multi-factor authentication, which is risk-based and adaptive. This is also one, so some of the one thing that can be used uh, to ensure that the right people only are provided access. Credential management, which was earlier, which could be called password management, which has become credential management right now because of the multiple factors that can be used, not just as a password for authenticating. Single sign-on, and then there is invalid and orphan account management. This is something that uh, that uh, uh, Carl was talking about a moment ago. It is, uh, let's say, for example, during uh, the deployments, etc., of systems, we create often uh, test accounts, a test account that has got uh, full administrative privileges, and that nobody is responsible for that test account. It just lies in the system and turns out to be a huge security threat. So with identity and with a good IAM solution, we will be able to identify these orphan accounts and any other invalid accounts and manage them, remove them if required, transfer them, whichever, based on whatever the rules that are defined, we can do them. Right, provide only the right access, to give only the right access, automated provisioning, so based and uh, role-based access, access, privileged access. So all these, like say, for example, what happens is as and when a person comes into the organization, the automated provisioning system, it picks up these uh, the details of this person and creates based on the person's roles and the privileges, creates accounts and accesses with the necessary permissions for this person in the various systems and applications where the user needs to have these. So that can make sure that that can ensure that only the right access is provided at that time. And if there are any accesses that are missing, users can request, make requests for these accesses. And with workflows of approval, they can be fulfilled that the person who does not have an access now gets these access and deprovisioning, of course, which makes sure that as and when this person does not need access, these are again based on rules. It could be based on a change in a, a class. It could be a change in a role based on whichever is the case. The workflows and the deprovisioning rules will kick in and will make sure that all these accesses which are no longer required are removed. So there, when it comes to the right resources, when it comes to right resources, yes, provisioning also takes care that access is provided only to the right resources. Single sign-on. Through single sign-on, we make sure that only the right resources can be accessed based on the person who's authenticating. Access requests with workflows also, yes, these are, this makes sure that the right resources are provided. Segregation of duties. So let me talk about that for a moment. Segregation of duties, this is where we define rules that uh, if a person can do something, then that person cannot do another thing. Uh, for example, uh, a person who has the ability to raise a reimbursement request should not have the ability to approve that uh, reimbursement request. Yeah, so we define rules like that in the system. So it makes sure that there is segregation of duties and only the right resources are available to that person at any time. Access reviews and certifications, this sends out a, at a pre-decided duration. It could be monthly, it could be quarterly. It sends out a notification to people saying that, hey, uh, in your team, there are 10 people or rather in your class, there are 15 students and these are the different applications that the person has got access to. Do you want to continue with this access or do you want to remove any of these accesses? So the person, all that person can do is say retain or revoke. 
So doing this periodically ensures that only the right resources are given access. Yeah, and deprovisioning, yes, through deprovisioning, we can ensure that no unauthorized access is available to any of the resources. Again, right time for the right, at the right time, this means, yeah, you can see that automated provisioning, single sign-on, yeah, just like say, uh, uh, what we were talking about with uh, uh, workflows, access requests and workflows, we said that, uh, so access requests and workflows, during approval, we can specify anytime during automated provisioning, we can specify that it is available for a specific duration of time, and we can just make sure that it is fixed to that that time. And it uh, sounds, sounds good. This yes. is a good solution. It sounds like you've considered all the options in terms of this solution. Uh, very, very, very nice. And uh, as you say, the graphics showing right people, right access, right resources, right time. That's critical, right? Because we don't want people getting into the wrong information. Um, I just wanted to see if we could uh, uh, invite Vinay to, you know, speak about his solution uh, at this point, or do you have anything else to finish up? Um, no, I think maybe I'll just take one more minute for the next slide and I can close. I just wanted to mention that uh, uh, we also have our vendors and service providers largely in three parts. One is the infrastructure providers, people who provide us specialized components and other platform and service integrations, say like a payment gateway, somebody like that. So we have to make sure that we ascertain security with each of these at each of these levels and do a consolidated penetration testing, vulnerability assessments, and then ensure that the security of the solution. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vince. Good stuff. Uh, appreciate that uh, input and the uh, kind of overview really helps uh, institutions understand uh, where they're at. I just want to give everyone an update in terms of the last poll question, which asked about the top issues, select all that apply. The top issue, 88% was that most institutions were concerned about where the funding and the resources were going to come to be able to implement identity and access management. Number two concern was, again, for training and support where the funding and resources were going to come. So the, I know that uh, a lot of the identity and access management plat platforms have solutions uh, for this to help institutions. So I think it's worth a discussion with a, a uh, vendor who provides these services. Now our next presenter is Vinay Kumar. He's an experienced, uh, technology executive, innovative leader. He graduated from Stanford University, and uh, Vinay is a managing director of Nine Star, a technology company that provides enterprise-grade shibboleth-based identity and access authentication solutions. Vinay, I'm going to hand it over to you, please. Okay, great. Thanks, Carl. Um, thanks for the introduction and the opportunity today. Um, as Carl mentioned, I'm the managing uh, director here uh, at Nine Star, overseeing the education market. And uh, the company has been focused on the education market uh, for almost 20 years now, uh, pretty much along the same timeline as Shibboleth. And we're a huge believer in Shibboleth. And uh, we've been supporting education customers in initially helping them adopt uh, uh, Shibboleth open source. Uh, in the early days, it was all on-prem and it still, we still support a lot of customers uh, that have Shibboleth on-prem. And as most of you know, um, uh, Shibboleth has grown tremendously. It's probably the most popular uh, single sign-on authentication uh, middleware platform today. Uh, not just higher education in U.S., it's higher education all over the world, and uh, even K through 12. And of course, by extension, uh, campuses work with outside vendors, commercial vendors, a lot of commercial vendors, Fortune 100 companies, uh, a lot of them use Shibboleth. And uh, so I thought I'd take this opportunity today to just sort of, instead of focusing on uh, our products, just uh, spend a few minutes uh, because there's a lot of confusion about Shibboleth in the marketplace. 
uh, the technical people know about it, but uh, in the management, sometimes uh, we tend to come across confusion. And what is Shibboleth? Shibboleth, uh, as I mentioned, is open source software initially funded by US Department of Education and Internet2 was a big supporter and, and promoter of uh, Shibboleth, got adopted worldwide by universities and colleges and community colleges and healthcare institutions and later by extension lie into a lot of commercial sectors as well. And uh, one of the best things about Shibboleth is it's independently tested by people around the world, by customers around the world. It's not a single vendor solution. It's not one vendor saying, oh, it's great. Uh, it's users themselves, IT departments, IT leaders around the world, testing it every day, reporting back vulnerabilities, vulnerabilities being fixed every day. It's a very transparent security middleware. And the architecture is such that it's, it's highly scalable and modular, meaning it doesn't force any customer to adopt a certain authentication technology or a certain uh, database technology or any specific framework. You can just plug your own in, uh, whatever you use today and whatever might come in future. So if you, for example, I think Carl mentioned, uh, somebody mentioned uh, today, uh, about passwordless. Uh, so yes, it, once uh, customers stop, start adopting pa passwordless mechanisms, Shibboleth is perfect. It can, somebody can write a login handler for passwordless and uh, it can be plugged in. So it supports all sorts of backend technology, like as you know, Active Directory, LDAP, a Duo, Duo is a big, uh, uh, is, is being adopted. A lot we see in the market in the higher education space, and Shibboleth supports that. And uh, among the app vendors, also the one of the key questions for customers we've noticed is they're nervous about adopting a technology unless they're sure it can scale as they add additional apps or additional technologies. So uh, Shibboleth works great for that. And one of the uh, patterns we are seeing in the marketplace, and I know I'm short on time, I have only one minute, but That's one of okay. the things that we're oh. noticing uh, in the marketplace is a lot of higher ed customers who had Shibboleth or has, still have Shibboleth on-prem are looking to migrate to the cloud. How do you do that? How do you do it in a cost-effective manner, less risky manner, without downtime, without adding a lot of man hours, uh, for the IT teams mm -hmm. that are involved. And, and so we provide the, uh, those cloud services today and we have been providing for 15 years. Uh, and I, I think there was another question. I'm just going all over the place because I don't have much time. Uh, no, 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 take your time. If we go a few minutes over, this is good because this video will be available to all our attendees, okay. today, but we're going to send it out to other members of the Campus Consortium and outside of Campus Consortium to the education community. So please say what you need to say. It's not a problem. A few minutes is not yeah, going to make it. No, that, yeah, I think that the well, one of the, the main uh, uh, things about higher education is cost of ownership and the budgets. So yeah. we over 20 years, we we work with so many customers in higher education that I think we have a very good idea why Shibboleth is so popular and it will continue to make more inroads going from on-prem to the cloud uh, where it removes a lot of complexity of managing it on-prem once Shibboleth has moved to the cloud. And uh, because of the powerful uh, nature of the architecture, and the scalability of the architecture, it plugs into future technologies that are right. not there yet. And so the risk in adopting Shibboleth are a lot lower in our opinion than uh, potentially other technologies. So, uh, but so, so that's uh, the, the higher level uh, detail about Shibboleth. And we, as for us, we provide uh, what customers want, cloud hosted uh, and managed uh, services around Shibboleth. 
and around identity management, around provisioning. Again, we're, we're big believers in open source and open standards. So we tend to see a lot of uh, provisioning issues uh, being resolved through open standards like SCIM. SCIM is a fairly popular uh, protocol for provisioning, deprovisioning, and uh, we support SCIM APIs to my, as customers start to migrate their data from existing apps, like somebody asked about Elucian, uh, but not just Elucian, it could be PeopleSoft, it could be uh, other HR, finance, and uh, SIS softwares where the, the original authoritative source of data resides. So that can be extracted using APIs, standardized APIs and migrated either to a repository on-prem or to a repository uh, based on need, based on timeliness uh, into the cloud. And so I think we are moving in the right direction and Shibboleth is definitely moving in the right direction. And, um, and with that, I'll hand it back to you, Carl. Sorry for taking two extra minutes. No, 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 no worries. Uh, uh, my apologies for, uh, you know, we kind of went a little bit over, but, you know, everyone, ev all of you presenters had excellent points from your perspectives. And I think that there is a solution in everything that's been presented today for not just the attendees that participated in our webinar today, uh, but also for all of education. And that's why we're here. Uh, we cover so much of the education sector and uh, while we do use common technologies as uh, the private sector uses, uh, there are unique aspects to the education community that must be addressed. And I think every vendor, uh, every company, every identity and access management platform that was represented today will address all those uh, specifics uh, that are applicable to the education sector. So I, I thank you, Vinay, for uh, really explaining uh, the nuances of this kind of universal technology that is worldwide uh, per se, but you've uh, be, you created a science and a practice around kind of containing that and and making that uh, accessible for education institutions. So I think that's uh, very good insight. Uh, so uh, I want to thank uh, everyone, all our presenters today, all our panelists. Uh, great input, great feedback. If any one of the attendees has questions or inputs or wants to make a connection with any of our participating panelists today, Campus Consortium is happy to do it. And we would be delighted to make that connection for you. Or you can reach out directly to any of our panelists. Uh, this uh, webinar will be sent out to you as a recording. You'll be able to see their contact information. Either way, we will make that connection for you. And it costs nothing for questions, right? So uh, whether you ask us, we are a nonprofit, happy to answer any questions uh, and, and make connections for you. But I'm sure that any one of our panelists today would be happy to have a discussion with you about their particular solution for identity and access management and how it applies to your institution. Uh, again, we'll create a brief or a report about this and we'll distribute that out also to the attendees so you have a lot of that information as well as the recording of this webinar. I wanna thank our panelists today, Deidre, Wolfgang, Vince, and Vinay. You guys were excellent. Very good input and information and a helpful resource for our attendees. I wanna thank our attendees for joining today from all over the country. Uh, great representation of attendees that uh, shows the diverse need for identity and access management. And also, I want to thank uh, the wonderful Campus Consortium staff, David Lilly, Hector Harvey, Sam, everybody who has contributed to make this uh, webinar possible and take care of all of the logistics and back end. And thank you again to all and have a great rest of the day. We'll see you at the next Ed Talk webinar.